Hello, RVA Sec. I'm Alan Householder. I'm with the CERC Coordination Center. Uh, we're based out of Pittsburgh at the Software Engineering Institute, which is part of Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, and I want to talk today about vulnerability coordination and uh, concurrency. This is an extension of a blog post that I did last December. We had, I don't know if I can get any, I can't get much closer to the microphone from where it's at. Is there a knob we can twist? All right. So first up, Carnegie Mellon has lawyers. They want you to see this. Read it fast because I'm going to go on. Um, <clears throat> so I want to talk about vulnerability coordination and concurrency. Uh, I'll cover some introduction and some motivations. Um, and then do a quick survey of other vulnerability disclosure models from the past and uh, talk about the work that, that I've done here and then some things that we've learned along the way. So before I get started, can I get a quick show of hands of who's in the room? People who have products that have vulnerabilities in them that you've received reports from? Any software vendors? Okay. How about folks who find vulnerabilities and report them? Okay. Folks who have systems they're trying to protect? Most of you, okay. Uh, so for, for a lot of you, this, this might, might be a little inside baseball, but it's kind of a, here's what happens upstream of, of what, you're, what you might be familiar with, with CVEs and vulnerabilities being made public. So just to start off, uh, if, if anyone hasn't heard of, heard of CERT, we've been around for a while. Uh, December 19, 1988 was one of our first advisories. We were formed right after the Morris Worm in November 1988. Um, because DOD was looking for some place to, to do this and Software Engineering Institute was there, so they, they asked us to start it up. So we've been around doing vulnerability disclosure uh, at least for 27 years. That was a long time ago, and so let's fast forward to the, to the slightly more recent past. So in <clears throat> March of, of last year, the Federal Trade Commission uh, issued a complaint against Fandango uh, citing that they, their software, their, their mobile app was susceptible to SSL man in the middle attacks. But as part of their complaint, they made an interesting point that Fandango didn't have a clearly publicized and effective channel for receiving security vulnerability reports. I'm not sure if this has ever, if this has ever shown up in a, an actual complaint by the government against a company before that you don't have a way of reporting vulnerabilities to you clearly and so that's a problem, and it's part of the complaint. That, that was kind of a, that was exciting for us because we've been trying to, we want vendors to have good contacts so that you can report calls to them and have these things get resolved. Um, this is the first time we've, we've seen that shown up in a, an actual complaint. More recently, uh, in January of this year, many of you may be aware that Google uh, uh, Project Zero announced a vulnerability in Windows that Microsoft was planning to patch a couple of days later, and they announced it before there was a patch. So Google makes the announcement. Microsoft posts a blog post that says, hey, you released a couple of days before a fix. That's kind of not cool. And Google updated their policy to say, well, we usually give 90 days. Uh, we're going to give, we'll also give you a 14-day grace period. Um, but we're still going to disclose whether or not you have a patch. So the motivations for this talk, in part, are because of that, you know, there, there's been a resurgence, resurgence in disclosure kerfuffles, and that's about the best word I can I can come up with because it's not it's not accurate to say that it's always the vendor's fault. It's not accurate to say that it's always the researcher's fault. There's lots of reasons that these things can go wrong, and that's the, the bulk of my talk here is a, is about how some of these things can go wrong. But we've seen we've seen them. It, we went for a while where there really weren't any, and then in the last year or two, we started to see you know big vendors throwing words at other big vendors complaining about how they're doing vulnerability disclosure. We've seen uh, talks getting taken off the conference schedule because somebody wasn't happy with the way it was going. We've seen threats of legal, legal uh, intervention. We've also observed that there's a proliferation of novice vendors. There are way more vendors out there today than there used to be. Uh, there's a lot of small vendors out there. It doesn't take much to, to go from being a guy who has an idea to a guy who has an app in an app store and boom, you're a software vendor and you need to be able to think about how you're going to deal with vulnerabilities in that. The coordination experience hasn't grown 
at the same rate. We've also seen, also seen that people are bolting IP stacks onto everything. Uh, I'm sure with a room full of, of technical folks at, at this conference, I don't need to talk about what IoT means, but it means that anything that can have an IP stack and even some things that can't will have IP stacks at some point. I already mentioned anyone can be, be an app creator. We've also seen that, that vol markets and bug bounties are changing the flow of information. It used to be you had a vol, you posted it to full disclosure, you're done. The vendor has to deal with whatever the, the aftermath is. Or you have a vol, you report it to cert, we tell the vendor 45 days later we publish a, publish a vol note, um, hopefully the vendor has a patch by then and, and things go on. But with bug bounties, uh, and especially with third party bug bounties where uh, you're paying, you may, be, you may have vulnerabilities that you're reporting to a, a third party who then reports it to the vendor, um, that starts to change the flow of information because money changes, the, changes how things go. Uh, third party libraries have, have become a, a major place where vulnerabilities arise in people's products because most, most folks, most developers don't know what's in the, in the third party libraries that they're using. They, know, they select them based on feature set, they don't necessarily select them for their security and it's very hard to assess the security of uh, software libraries that you're including. Obviously there's a rampant growth in both awareness of security by the general public and the, and the security industry itself is bigger. Uh, there's a lot of folks uh, in the room and, and at conferences nowadays that weren't around for the first couple round, first couple times these conversations happened in the late 90s and the early 2000s. Uh, so folks that are new to the industry may not have heard many of, many of the uh, discussions about vulnerability disclosure. Although it has been pointed out that this predates all of us. Uh, there was a, there's a quote there from 1853 about locks and, and whether or not you should talk about lock picking. Uh, recently, Pete Aller from IBM uh, had a blog post where he, he mentioned that you know, we need to reconsider our approach to disclosure uh, because the system of systems and the interactions are, are getting are more complicated. So one of the ways that, that, I, that I've thought about this, and so I work at CERT, which is part of Software Engineering Institute, which is part of Carnegie Mellon University. We think in terms of like math and models and, and trying to put some structure around this problem. So the reason for creating models, you know, these are operational operational processes that exist at vendors, that exist at, at security companies. Um, and it's really hard to convince somebody that they need to change their process just because you have an idea that might be good and might work. So part of, part of this is we can, you know, we can use models to describe, uh, to talk about the process and see what we can change about the process without necessarily having to, to change the process, it's the actual production operations. Um, also, by building the models, we can we can remove some of the detail of the of the nitty gritty of every single vol report, and talk about here's how the process works. And hopefully, if we disagree on the models, and we have reasons for our disagreement, we can create better models that reflect both how the world works and how it should work better. So, I'm going to do a quick run through of some previous some previous models that are out there. Uh, there's a, a paper from. Bill Arbaugh, Bill Fifth, and then John McHugh from 2000 uh, that was talking about windows of vulnerability. And this, this talks about what happens before the vulnerability is disclosed, and then once it's disclosed, lots of things can happen. Uh, you might get a patch, you might get a, it might be automated and turned into malware. That vulnerability might get some publicity, and eventually the last machine that has that vulnerability is either is no longer deployed or it's, it's patched. There was an IETF uh, draft put out in 2002 by Steve Christie and Chris Wasopel, uh, which essentially talked about the vulnerability disclosure process uh, from notification through validation, resolution, release, and, and follow-up. And that's a linear process, and th this was the, the draft that was called, uh, in the title, it, it was Responsible Vulnerability Disclosure Process, which has caused some discussion over the years intervening. Uh, this was a recent conversation that I just happened to catch on Twitter between the Gruck and Chris Wasopel, one of the authors of the document, uh, in which basically they, they, Chris acknowledged that, yeah, responsible might not have been quite the best word, uh, largely because it implies a value judgment. 
and that turns it into an argument over competing perspectives and who's responsible, who's not responsible, uh, who's doing the right thing. And that's not really the point. The point is to get the vulnerabilities fixed and get the and get people get the you know, the people who have to defend networks actionable information that they know what to do about it. So we use the term coordinated disclosure. We've used it before Microsoft published it as a as a thing a few years ago. Um, we've, vulnerability coordination has been a thing that CERT's been doing for for a while. Um, and we really I really want to point out that coordinated coordinated disclosure doesn't necessarily mean you have to wait for the vendor to patch before you say anything about it publicly. There are lots of good reasons that you may need to talk about vulnerabilities before there's a patch available, in part just to motivate, that, that threat helps to motivate the, the vendors to, to take action. Although, the, the Obi-Wan caveat applies here, that most of the things we cling to are depend a lot on our own point of view. So vendors have one perspective, security researchers have another perspective, the government has a, has a perspective, the government actually has multiple perspectives. Um, but. Our, our take is, is that, you know, if you keep the goal in mind of people who have vulnerable systems get them fixed and know what to do to, to make them safer, then that's, that's good for everybody. Back in 2004, there were a couple other things that came out. There was a NIAC report, uh, which is available on the DHS website, that also has a generally linear flow of you find a vol, you tell somebody about it, you get a patch, you deploy a patch. Uh, there was also an Organization for Internet Security Guidelines, which has lots of nifty diagrams on it that I don't intend you to read here, um, just making the point that, that they, they drew lots of arrows with circles. But the, again, this is generally the, a linear process, um, and all I can find about OIS these days is this the PDF that these documents are in. I think the website evaporated. Uh, there's also been some work uh, on the academic side about the social value, uh, social welfare values of, of disclosing vulnerabilities. And in this report, uh, there was essentially that acknowledging that the, that the vendor is motivated to not patch as soon as they, as they would be, unless they're actually internalizing the cost to the user of having to deal with those vulnerabilities. So the more responsive the vendor is to the user losses, the more aggressive the social planner, and what they mean is basically the, the, the quicker you should be able to turn around vulnerabilities because more responsive vendors that care about users are going to be motivated to do that. But they also conclude that neither instant disclosure nor infinite delay are the right way, are the right place, uh, or, or the best solution. There, there's some middle ground of delay, but don't delay forever. Uh, more recently, there, there's some other research which started to look at uh, vulnerability markets and how, that's, how that sort of shifts the, the flow of vulnerability information between people paying for vols and people who are doing disclosing for free. Uh, but again, up in the upper left-hand corner here, the main point is that they, you know, it's still a linear model. And then at RSA conference uh, last month, uh, Katie Masaurus and, uh, and others, uh, sorry, the print's too small for here for me to read it, uh, were uh, talked about a, a system dynamics model where they were trying to figure out how can you turn the knobs to make sure that vulnerabilities get fixed as opposed to just disappearing on, you know, behind the curtain and never getting fixed. So some things that are missing from all of these models were that you know, the early ones are all, are all narrative and prescriptive advice. They all talk about linear models that go from start to finish and, uh, but e even, even the earliest one that I cited there mentions in the paper that they rarely encounter, we rarely encounter cases with our preferred ordering of you fix it, it doesn't turn into malware, and it goes away quietly. Um, some of the later models, you know, they start to incorporate social cost and the motives of participants and money and markets, but they're not really talking about how disclosure, coordinated disclosure can fail. So I, I got to the point where I was watching a bunch of, of vulnerability coordinations go sideways one you know in one sense or another and started to think about this well why why is it hard to describe and part of it to me was that this is really a concurrency problem you've got a researcher who has goals and objectives and a timeline you've got vendors who have goals and objectives and something they have to do you may also have coordinators involved in the middle like cert uh, there may be multiple vendors there may be other researchers there's there's all sorts of, of things that can affect these timelines so you know these 
the disclosure process itself is already a multi-party, human-centric process, you know, with vendors, researchers, coordinators, but there's other stakeholders involved as well, like service providers. You know, when, the, when a major router vault comes out, there are service providers who have to get things deployed on a very large scale. Um, obviously, governments have, have an interest in vulnerability information for multiple reasons, um, and of course, users and, and people who have systems that they need to protect. And each of those parties is really not just a single party, but they're, you know, it's a complex interaction of a lot of people and their processes, policies, and procedures. So my model that, that I came up with is using PetriNets, and I'll just do a very quick run through of, of the notation here. So circles are places, and the boxes are transitions. So transitions are events that happen. Think of them as verbs. Uh, circles are, are kind of the nouns. And places can hold tokens. When a, when a token is present in the place, then the transition is enabled, and then when the transition fires, the, the token moves. So essentially, all, all you're really seeing is you know these tokens just kind of move through the, the graph as you go. So a very simple model of vulnerability disclosure, and I think this is the simplest simplest possible one that is even remotely interesting. Uh, so you've got a vol exists, and either stuff happens or other stuff happens, and the end result is that if stuff happens, the public becomes aware of a vulnerability at the same time that they become aware of the fix. Well, the other way that could have gone was other stuff happened, and now the public becomes aware of a vulnerability, and you've got a zero-day situation where there's a vulnerability that everyone knows about, but there's no fix. That's not very good. So stretching this out a little bit, the easiest, way to, easiest place to start is with a vendor. And we can have a vendor who, you know, the vulnerability has to exist before you can find it, and let's say that the vendor finds the vault. So now they're aware of it, but they haven't started to do anything with it. Um, and the, the two ba basic things that a vendor can do with a vulnerability are they can write up a report about it or they can fix it. Um, often you want them to do both. In fact, we always want them to do both. Um, for the purposes of the discussion here, let's just say that writing a document is easier than patching the software, so they write the document and now they, now they work on the fix. Both of those events happened and now you saw that the uh, publication event transition becomes available. And that happens, and they both, the public becomes aware of the fix in the vault at the same time. So this is just simple, you know, vendor finds out about a vault, they publish something about it, they talk about the, write a document, they publish the fix, and, and the process is done. But there's also the option that the vendor might publish something before they have a fix ready. Uh, they're aware of ex active exploitation or lots of reasons that they may decide to announce something before they're, they're totally ready to go. So, I fix that in the next version of the model, and this version also adds a researcher in addition to the vendor. So now we've got some more interesting interactions that can happen. So in this case, since we've already talked about the vendor flow, we'll just we'll start with the researcher. The researcher might find a vulnerability, and they decide they're going to start writing it up. Um, in the flow through this model, their option is that they're ready to publish, but now they're just going to publish it as full disclosure. They're just going to drop, drop zero day on the vendor. So they do. Now the public's aware of the vulnerability. The vendor's also aware of the vulnerability because hopefully they're reading the security mailing list. But now they've got to do all this catch up work. And so they write the fix, they create the fix, and they publish it. And hopefully the public becomes aware a second time of the vulnerability, but now there's a fix for it. But we can also rewind that decision to, instead of the researcher just publishing it, they might decide to notify the vendor. And now, we can actually run this as a concurrent process. We've got, we've got tokens in motion across the top and the bottom, the researcher end and the, and the vendor end. And if they all agree to wait, sorry, if they all agree to wait, then we're good. But there's also the option here that the researcher might still go full disclosure, even though they report it to the vendor. Well, why would that happen? Um, one example in the last month or two was there was a there was a Minecraft vault that was, an, was announced, and it was only at that point did, uh, did Mojang slash Microsoft, who now owns them, did they realize that, oh, we actually hadn't fixed that. So it was the publication of the vulnerability report that brought it to their attention that they thought they had fixed something, and it turned out they hadn't. Uh, the researcher in this case you know, notes that in his comments that you know, it was a combination of miscommunication and a lack of testing that led to the situation, and hopefully it can be a good learning experience. So I think we fulfilled that since you're here, you're listening to me talk about it, so hopefully you learned something. 
So going back to the, uh, before the full disclosure happens, if, if the researcher's still waiting, the vendor gets ready, and now we've got a bunch of different ways this can go. The researcher can, can publish it first, the vendor can publish independently, or they can all go at the same time, which has traditionally been what's referred to as responsible disclosure, um, which we're now calling coordinated disclosure, but again, the end result here is public becomes aware, the vendor becomes aware of the fix and the vault at the same time. All right. So this is becoming an increasingly complex eye chart here. Uh, this one has a researcher and a vendor, but it also has a coordinator. And this comes into play when the researcher might find a vulnerability, but they don't know who to talk to with the vendor. The situation we talked about with Fandango, where I have no idea who, to talk, who I should report this to. Uh, they may contact a, a coordinator like CERT or a, a bug bounty, and the coordinator then contacts the vendor, and now we've got the researcher doing their thing, the coordinator is doing their thing, they're all preparing documentation uh, to publish, and the vendor has to do their thing, create a patch, and the main point of this whole chart is just look how many green boxes there are, those are all things that could happen. Um, so even at this point where everyone is actually collaborating and coordinating on this, it, it can still go wrong a lot of different ways. There's only really one transition here that makes it work so that the vendor, so the, the, the vault comes out at the same time as the patch, when that happens, uh, everything's good. So this is what it looks like when you start to add in things like a miscreant, you know, bad guy who may find out about the vault and do something to you as well. Also, I, I added CVE and NVD here, not, not because they're the end all of all of these processes, but just to highlight the fact that entries in, in the CVE database and uh, CVE dictionary and the NVD database don't happen until all of this process has already gone on. So there's, there's, a, there's a lot of complexity upstream of, of CVEs. And the other point is that this is still just a single vendor vulnerability. So I tried to actually say, well, what happens if they add a second vendor? And I got about that far with it and gave up. Because there are limits to using Petrinus to model this kind of stuff. Mainly, uh, as you've probably guessed from sitting there watching these charts get more complicated, it's really hard to present it in a way that's understandable once you get so many interactions going on. Um, from, a, from a modeling standpoint, the state space grows very quickly and it's, and it's tough to actually work through it and, and use the model. And also, Petrinets in particular have a, have a weakness in that they really don't, they're not very good for modeling the history of, of events as they occurred. So, there are things that would happen differently in the disclosure process depending on which path you had followed to get there. Um, this really just talks about how, you know, how you maintain synchronization across, across them, but the, it, doesn't, it doesn't really account for the history of who moved first in which, in which situations. So one of the things we're, we're looking into now is whether agent-based models uh, could work better. For example, with a state machine uh, like this where each, each player essentially starts out unaware of a vulnerability, uh, they learn about it, and now they're, you know, they're actively working on it. Uh, they may have to ask somebody outside a question, so they go into a wait state. Eventually, the answer comes back, and they resume work. Or they might also be waiting for so long that they just get bored and move on to other things, or their priorities may shift. They move on to, to other other things, um, and they become disengaged. E either way, eventually, either you publish, you stop work on it, or you abandon the whole process. Excuse me. The cool thing about that sort of model is that it lets you start to build more complex models than, you know, with, without having all of that that interaction complexity that, that was in the PetriNet model. Uh, we can we can start to talk about vendors, researchers, and coordinators, and we can talk about multiple parties being in, involved in this, and even adding uh, adding more 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 stakeholders to the process. Uh, and they may have different actions that they take and different processes that you could model internal to their to those things. So a lot of this is just helping to describe uh, to you guys, and also you know part of part of the motivation for us doing this was uh, we had some new guys coming on board that were starting to get involved in vulnerability coordination, and we wanted to explain to them, you know, here's here's how complex this thing is, and all the pieces you need to know understand that fit together. Um, but some of the things that, that we've learned at CERT from doing this for, for a long time is really that you know, there, are, there are things that break and there are things that work. So let me talk about some of the things that, 
that, that break the process. Um, first up is that vulnerability co coordinated disclosure is a human oriented process. This is not about the data as much as it is about people noticing things, people telling other people about things, and expecting them to do something about it. So you kind of have to factor in all of all of the psychology stuff you can in that you know people have different knowledge, they have different motives, uh, everybody has limited attention, they've got emotions, they can get angry, they can be happy, uh, they've got biases, they, they notice some things they, and they ignore others, uh, they may or may not perceive perceive things that, that are, are not there, and importantly they have expectations. Um, every one of those, those factors affects the decisions and actions that the players make in these sorts of in, in disclosure process, and because you've got multiple parties doing it, that's kind of the origin of the complexity of, of some of these things. And really, when you, when you take that as the background and look at, well, how can things actually fall apart? First up is the researcher and the vendor may not be able to, to find each other, uh, and the channel may not get established. So if the vendor doesn't have a, have a contact for where do you report vulnerabilities, that's the first place it falls apart. Um, if the contact is, if you can find a contact, but they're non-responsive, and it might be that they're not the right contact, it might be that there's no one watching the inbox, it might be that uh, they just don't care. <laughs> you know, there's there's lots of reasons why the contact, the vendor contact, might not be responsive. Um, that can stop things from from moving on as well. Uh, we found that the more companies that have have Twitter accounts, uh, if they don't have a good security contact that's findable via Google, like if you search for reporter vulnerability to company name, uh, chances are your Twitter account is going to get some vol reports one way or another. Um, and most, most Twitter accounts are run by marketers who have no idea what that process looks like uh, or where they should report it to and they, they think it's a tech support problem and it's, and it's really not. Or the contact might be your tech support, in which case if your tech support is asking for your customer account number before they will talk to you, the person reporting the vol doesn't have an account. They may not have your soft, they may not be a customer of yours. They just know about something that you need to know about and they're trying to tell you and they're trying to do the right thing, but you're putting barricades in their way and at some point they say, screw it, I'm done. I'm gonna just drop this, drop zero day at a conference. So having a vendor contact, useful thing. The other thing we've seen is that the receiver can saturate, uh, meaning, that, that they're they just out of bandwidth to deal with the, the amount of reports they've got coming in. Maybe it's there's one guy and he's only got half a day a week to deal with this. Maybe it's that there's a team, but they just got a whole bunch of things dropped on them. Maybe it's Black Hat DEF CON season and everybody's aiming all of their guns at one vendor. Um, that happens. You know, sometimes it's just it's just the human process or or the cognitive load that, that overcomes it. I mean, there, there's, uh, when you get so many tickets in at once, you know it might just be that you're not you're not doing a very good job of triaging them. So there's there's lots of reasons that that can that can fall apart on the vendor side. It also can fall apart on the researcher side. So a researcher reports a bug to a, a, a vendor. Uh, the vendor responds with a question, and the researcher has moved on to something else, and now they're busy and they don't respond. So that can happen on that side as well. Uh, the channel can break down. As we saw with the, the Minecraft example, synchronization can be lost, where you think you're in state A where it's fixed, and the researcher knows that you're in state B where it's not fixed. Um, you can have mismatched, mismatched expectations. Uh, as Things as simple as, we're going to release this report at 8 a.m. That's not specific enough unless you're both in the same time zone and you both know that you're in the same time zone. Uh, just last week we had a report that we were expecting to publish at 8 a.m. and it turns out they published it overnight because we failed to notice that the reporter was in Germany and the vendor is in, on the west coast. We're in the eastern time zone, so you know no, nobody really agreed on what 8 a.m. meant. Uh, we've also seen situations where the channel breaks down because one side or the other goes non-responsive. Like I said, there's there, there are lots of reasons just from the human process failures or, or time uh, attention re requirements that, that that can happen. It may also happen because one side goes hostile. Uh, you know, you want to quash the vulnerability information so you get your legal department involved and send cease and desist letters and get conferences, conference presentations stopped and all those sorts of things. Um, 
that, in the end, has, has a long-term effect of chilling future reports coming to you. So for, if, you're, if you're a software vendor, the thing, that, the thing we need to get, that we want to convince you of is that vol reports are not one-off games. It's a repeated game. It's, it's, you're playing the same game over and over again with the same people or with people who talk to each other and the players know what you did the last time. And the more responsive you are to one, to one reporter, one researcher who reports a vol to you, the more responsive you are likely to be to the next one. Uh, Wikipedia has a good article about strategies for the iterated prisoner's dilemma. I encourage you to go read it. But in, in essence, what, what they say is, is that the you know, winning strategies tend to look like they're, they're nice and forgiving, but they're also retaliating and non-envious, which sounds, sounds a little counterproductive. But it kind of goes back to the, I'll work with you as long as you're working with me. But once, once you stop working with me, you know, the deal's off. We're going we're gonna to go our separate ways. So these are kind of the classes of problems that we've, that we've seen. We've also observed a, a few different flavors of problems that arise from uh, single vendor, many vols, many vols, many vendors, many vols, one vendor sorts of issues. So I'll start with, a, with one vendor that has many vols. Uh, I, I've also spent a good bit of my time developing the, the CERT uh, basic fuzzing framework and, and FO. Uh, they're both fuzzers that, that can find lots of vulnerabilities fairly quickly at scale. Um, a few years ago, we reported 73 uh, test cases that we had found via fuzzing to, I think it was FFmpeg in this case. They've gotten better since, but their, their response at that time was 73 reports is too much for us to handle at once. You know, come back when you have, when, when, you, can, when you can piece it out to us. Um, our fuzzers now can find thousands of crashing test cases which are labeled as exploitable by things like Microsoft's Bang Exploitable tool or the, we, we come up with a, a Linux version of uh, the CERT triage tools. So at that point, we can't even assess internally to us how many vols do we really have uh, to report and tracking that is very difficult and sending these big, uh, we'll call them volplosions <laughs> of you know, basically dropping thousands of, of failing test cases onto a vendor all at once, it's really hard for them to, to deal with that. Most of the vulnerability coordination pieces at vendors and coordinators and uh, even downstream of that are all built around the idea that vulnerabilities are relatively rare. They're, they're unique events. You can handle them by hand. You can carry them through and get them fixed. Uh, that's just not, doesn't appear to be true anymore. Um, we can find lots of vols and we don't have an easy way of reporting the vendors in bulk and they don't have an easy way to deal with them in bulk and downstream of that doesn't really have a way to deal with it either. We've seen many vendors with one vault. Um, Heartbleed is, is a canonical example of this that most people have heard of, even my mom. Um, <clears throat> and the interesting thing about Heartbleed is that it drew my attention to, their, to the OpenSSL disclosure policy, which makes some very good points that the more people you tell in advance, the higher the likelihood that a leak occurs and when you've got very widespread libraries that have vols in them, it may actually be the best policy to just drop it on everybody all at once because if you tell some people but not others, there's, there's jealousy and anger and people get upset because why did you tell them and you didn't tell me? Um, that's, that's a legitimate, a legitimate stance. They also make the point that maintaining vendor contacts is hard. Um, knowing who the security contacts are at a lot of vendors is difficult. Uh, we've got about 11, 1,200 vendors that we maintain contacts with, and that's a significant amount of our vulnerability coordination effort that we put into it, is just maintaining those contacts, getting the PGP keys exchanged, explaining to somebody what PGP is and why they ought to use it before we can send them a vulnerability, like, you know, or that they, explaining to them what a vulnerability is, or explaining to them that who we are and we're not the police and, you know, all sorts of weird things that, that come up when most of your vendors are new at any given point in time, they've decided that that wasn't that wasn't worth their time to do. Uh, OpenSSL also said that they've worked with other with other third parties as well, including us, and they felt that none were suitable at that time for Heartbleed. That's fine. That's their decision. If anyone hears from OpenSSL, I would like to talk to you though. I'm curious to know why. Um, 
And, and they essentially decided it's in the best interest of the internet to get fixes out quickly and just have everyone deal with the pain. The second case of many vendors with one vol that we've seen is a recent Android work that we did where we downloaded a million apps from the Android app store. We had automated testing for uh, which ones were vulnerable um, to a particular SSL man in the middle attack. Uh, we notified 20, almost 24,000 vendors via email that they were vulnerable. We got a little over 1,000 responses back, and 26 of them said, we fixed it. That's a log scale in the graph, just to make the point that almost nobody responded that they'd fixed it. But in the process of doing that, we had to ask ourselves, so how do you notify that many vendors for that long over, over a period of time? We decided that we were going to send the email to the contact that was listed in the app store because that's the only thing we could automatically harvest. This frustrated a number of vendors because we already had security contacts established with those vendors, but we chose to use their app contact, which was some third party that they had licensed, licensed the app from in the first place. CERT has a 45-day rule for we'll tell the vendor we're going to note, we'll give you 45 days before we publish it. Uh, in this case, we decided not to not to do that because uh, the attacker doesn't get to pick which apps you're running, um, and if they're doing man in the middle attacks, they're already out there. We are, we were already aware of man in the middle attacks occurring, so we decided we were going to go with the we've got an active exploitation policy uh, that you know we'll, we'll publish early. Um, based on some feedback we got from vendors early on after dropping this on them, they we we decided to give them give them seven days advance warning. And finally, our own publishing system couldn't handle publishing 23,000 vulnerability records uh, in, in an automated way in that short period of time. So we used a Google spreadsheet for that. Other things that break. Well, have you all heard of CVE 10K? Did, did you all realize that, that CVE had to add an extra, extra, extra digit so that they, they could continue to count vulnerabilities last, last year and early this year? Um, so we, got to, we had assigned CVEs to about the first 2,000 vulnerabilities. We asked them for 5,000 more CVE IDs. They called us and said, can we not do that? Because we're, it's going gonna, it's gonna to blow up downstream of us that the, the people who consume CVE couldn't handle that increase in volume, nor could they handle creating the, the records in the first place. You know, we wound up with 24,000 uh, apps that were vulnerable. Every one of those, in our opinion, should have, would have been CVE. It's the same vulnerability, so if one got an ID, they probably all should have gotten the ID. But the distinction here is that when you look at CVE counts for last year, it was 4,000 or 6,000, depending on who's counting. Um, so the main point here is that vol databases undercount lots of things, and they're, they're missing lots of things. We've also seen many vendors with many vols, and this is where the coordination aspect of what we do really comes into play. Most vols, you know, it's one vendor, one researcher. They can talk to each other. They can get things resolved. If the vendor's, if the vendor's good enough, they'll they'll figure it out, and get it fixed. Um, in some cases, there are vulnerabilities that affect lots of vendors, and there's lots of different fixes that have to happen. And you got to try to get all of those parties to kind of move at the same pace so that they're all going to publish at the same time. Um, every one of these vols listed here uh, over the last twenty some years has has required over a thousand messages back and forth between between CERT and the vendors to, to get it coordinated and published. Um, <clears throat> the average vol for CERT gets four to six messages, which is basically, here's a report, thanks for your report, we're going to publish, okay, done. Some, some vols wind up being over a thousand. One vol wound up being almost eight thousand. Uh, this is by far the largest vol we've ever seen in terms of coordination effort. It was an SNMP vulnerability, uh, in part driven by some fuzzing work done out of Finland. Um, the guys that eventually turned into Codenomicon at, the, at that point where it was a university research thing, they came up with a test suite, they ran it against all of these SNMP implementations, and it turns out everything was vulnerable to almost everything, and very complex matrix of who's vulnerable to what. It took months, months to coordinate it before it was published, and there were just astronomical amount of effort. So things that, things that we found that work, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip ahead to the bottom of the slide here. Um, 
you know, I've already mentioned clear and findable instructions for how to report vols to you if you're a vendor. Um, acknowledging receipt of those vols quickly, just because uh, researchers get antsy if they haven't heard back from you in a short period of time. And setting expectations clearly, what you're gonna do when, you're gonna, when you expect to have a fix, when, you, when the researcher can expect to hear from you. You know, maintaining that open channel of communications is really important. Um, you may decide to offer a bug bounty. In general, our opinion, in my opinion, is that you know, threatening to sue or suing researchers is a bad idea, mostly because publicity works in counterintuitive ways. If it gets, if word gets out that you're trying to stop using legal, stop a researcher from talking about vulnerabilities in your product using legal means, you've just drawn the attention of all of the other people who are going to find vulnerabilities in your product, and they're not, they're not going to play as nicely. And in general, just have a cooperation bias. Assume that people are trying to help you make your product better. Generally, a good idea. Um, for researchers, obviously, contact the vendor before going public. And if you can't find a vendor contact or they're non-responsive, ask for help. Clear, concise reports are, are always good and appreciated by everybody involved. Um, and if you have constraints like a conference publication date or something, like say so. Um, and finally, just, just to avoid that, that Minecraft incident, you know, give the vendor a final warning, because a single email would have solved that and said, hey, I'm gonna publish this, and they may have noticed, oh, we didn't actually fix it yet, and they can, they can react accordingly. Um, corollary to that, don't assume that the vendor is ignoring you if, if it's intentional. There's lots of reasons that could happen. Um, EFF has some good information about, about rights for researchers, and again, having a cooperation bias is a good thing. So, to wrap this up, First observation, and it's part of this goes back to the, the, the CVE 10K problem and the 24,000 vols that we, that we found in Android, but <clears throat> there are average stats that come out like vulnerabilities report, vulnerability reports per year, and you'll see these in every, uh, all of the threat intelligence reports that come out, they talk about there were 4,712 vulnerabilities last year, whatever the number is, and that number has been growing, and they'll show a graph that shows it growing. Uh, the point is, they're all undercounting, and it's much, it's, it's worse than it appears. I mean, even, even as steep as that curve looks, it's worse. So, uh, you know, it, it may look like the effort involved in, and, and the other thing is that the average, the average number of messages per vol, like I said, is like four for us. We just, as a quick acknowledgement, get it done, get it out the door. But some vols are very, very large and require a lot of coordination. So, if, you're building storm sewers to handle the average daily rainfall, you get floods. Because that's not how storms work. Storms come along, mo the average rainfall on a day is very low. You know, most places don't rain most of the time. But some days you get hurricanes, and some days you get really bad hurricanes. And so if you build for the average rainfall, you're, you're, building, the wrong, you're building the wrong capacity. And that applies to handling, you know, coordinating vulnerabilities, that applies to dealing with the reports as they come in at a vendor. Um, for that matter, that even deals with the, the incident uh, or the, the, the dealing with patches as, as you're trying to deploy patches. You have to have enough capacity to deal with the worst flood you can imagine over a given time frame. And sometimes you're going to be wrong. Uh, second major point, there's no, there is no one-size-fits-all disclosure policy. You know, we've got, we, we've dealt with traditional shrink wrap software for a long time and traditional computing, but there's enterprise customization, there's continuous deployment of, of uh, services and systems. You've got mobile apps and app stores, cloud services, whether infrastructure, platform, or software as a service, um, and embedded devices and smart things. All of these have different constraints on how disclosure probably should happen. Some of them are easy to fix. You can, you can put a fix into your continuous deployment system, it gets automatically tested, and it rolls out within minutes. Uh, or you might have an embedded device that you gotta put somebody on a helicopter and fly them up into northern Canada to have them climb a tree to go fix something that has an IP stack on it. Uh, there is ISO work recently. Uh, 29147 is the standard for externally facing vulnerability uh, coordinated disclosure. There's also uh, 3111 that covers sort of the internal processes inside a vendor. Uh, but if you're developing a developing a security policy for or a policy for receiving vulnerability reports, you ought to look at that. It has a framework for how to how to construct those. And finally, uh, certs out there, we're, we want to help, 
Um, if you've got vulnerabilities that are not the simple kind, like the uh, you know sing single vendor falls, pretty easy to solve. Most vendors are mature enough that they they can handle those reports on their own. Uh, multi vendor falls get more complicated. May need some outside help. Um, if the vendor is not responding or you're afraid of host hostility from vendors, um, if there aren't any, if they don't offer a bug bounty or it doesn't apply um, or the terms are unacceptable, you're otherwise ineligible. You need some help with with coordinating a, a vulnerability, um, or for that matter, if you desire to remain anonymous, there are some situations where I know about a vault, I want it to get it fixed, but I actually don't want to have my name attached to it. You know, we, we deal with those up at, from time to time as well. Um, our vault report form is at forms.cert.org slash vault report. Uh, hopefully that's easy enough to find that you can report to us. And we would hope that if you if you need us, that you call us, uh, uh, contact us through the, the vault report form and uh, hopefully we can help. Got a lot of links here for more info and I think I'm just about out of time, so I'll wrap it up. Any questions? So I, I wouldn't use the term bad bug bounty programs. I, so bad, bad could have two meanings. I'm, I'm going to avoid one of them. Uh, bad insofar as unethical, I'm going to set that one aside. That's kind of a different topic. Bad as in not, not fulfilling the objective that they may have had. Uh, we've, we've spoken to vendors who, uh, and I'm not, not going to name specifics, but we, we have spoken to vendors who originally set up a bug bounty that they were uh, paying a bounty on their released software. And once the software goes gold, it releases and the development team disbands because now you're in maintenance mode. And so if your bug bounty only applies to release software, as soon as you release and you're, you're, the developers are going away and they're moving on to other projects or whatever, uh, you wind up with this flurry of, of uh, vulnerability reports coming in and the people who could fix them are gone, right? So the, the ideal here is, and we've seen this with, uh, I think IE, the IE bug bounty a while back did this, where they set the bounty as you know, during the beta period or during the alpha period, the bug bounty applies. Once it, goes, once it releases, it doesn't. So they're trying to, you know, what, what they don't want you to do is go download the beta, uh, find all the vols in it, and then hold them until it goes until it goes master or gold, whatever they call it, whatever you call it, you don't you don't want that to happen because then all of the vaults come in after the team's gone. There's uh, lots of vendors have, have have kind of recognized this and they're starting to push. Uh, they'll do the bug bounty during a beta period or during during the period when you've got the testers available. You've got the people who can handle the reports. That team, you know, that it grows in size over a period of time and then it starts to drop right before release. Well. You want to line up the bug bounty so that the reports are coming in at the point where you have the most capacity to deal with them. I think that's that's probably the, the best example we've got for, for that. I know it's different. I'm not sure that it's. Yeah, I I don't have any I don't have any direct uh, direct examples I can think of, of of cases where it's it's notably better. I think just the fact that it's usually open discussions with multiple parties, not all of whom serve the same masters, tends to make it a little more honest. Uh, there's less you can hide in an open source project. Um, so if somebody reports a vulnerability, you know it's Fairly, it's, it's going to be fairly clearly defined whether or not it actually the vault actually exists, and when it gets fixed, it's it's going to be hard to, to squash that. Um, we've seen closed source vendors who will say we fix the following CVEs, and they provide no information about what those CVEs are. Um, so it's it's easier for closed source to kind of not really hide, but obfuscate what they fixed and how they fixed it. 
open source obviously has more of a public track record that's that's explorable. Um, that's probably the major difference I can I can think of off the top of my head. Okay. Thank you very much.